So another aspect of the biology of the tea factory that we need to understand is what happens when you bring clastic sediment into the system. So here you see a nice coastline with waves bringing sediment, sand, into the water. So how will this actually impact the tea factory? Well, one of the reasons the first diagram I showed you was theoretical and was not um, had no scale in terms of water depth or light penetration is because these are extremely variable. So here I'm showing you multiple location. In black, you have the area of active reef growth. In gray, it's areas of strongly reduced reef growth. And in white, it's areas of maximum depth. That's the last area in which the reef can grow. The vertical axis is meters below sea level. And we have different locations. And I just want to focus on a few key locations that represent the end member of this spectrum. Let's look at Pacific Atoll, like the Maldives. The Pacific Atoll, you can see, have active reef growth down to probably 80 meters, so quite deep. And there's still strongly reduced reef growth, but reef growth nonetheless, down to 130 meters below sea level, which is extremely deep. So that implies that you have enough light penetrating to that depth for the reefs to still be growing, although slowly. It implies that the water column is very clean, and that makes sense because we are in the middle of the Pacific, there is very little suspension material in the waters. There is very little clastic material in the water that would block or absorb sunlight much faster. So that's why you can have active reef growth so deep. By contrast, look at some of the other location. Let's look at Singapore or let's look at the Persian Gulf where we may have water conditions that are less clean, where you have more classic input from the land around there. And you can see that there, the the active reef growth is limited to a few tens of meters, maybe 10, 20 meters, but you have no reef growth deeper than that. So turbidity or the amount of sediment in the water column plays a big role in controlling where carbonates can be deposited. And this is also one reason why the wave energy that cleans the water, cleans the sediments away, is beneficial for carbonates growth. Another aspect of the presence of a continent is how much nutrients are being brought by rivers and by runoff. So nutrient could be, for instance, phosphorus or nitrate, anything that would actually promote growth of heterotroph organisms, in particular algae. And nutrients are really not beneficial for autotrophic organisms because they don't need that much nutrients they need sunlight and a little bit of nutrients. But algae and other organisms thrive in high nutrients. So here I'm showing you an example from a paper that looked at the impact of nutrient input in Princess Charlotte Bay. You can see this beautiful brown, beautiful if I can speak this way, brown streak of nutrient being washed away from the continent into the water. And you can see that this triggers algal blooms and these nutrients then reach eventually the corals and where you have those high nutrient front you will tend to have less active reef growth because there is more competition by algae and again that will tend to clog the surface of the corals or perhaps also block sunlight so it's detrimental to the uh, corals to, to production of autotroph organisms. There is also another aspect to it, is if you have too much nutrients, you have overproduction of um, different organisms, again, bacteria and algae being chief amongst them, and that will consume oxygen. So on this plot here, what we see is on the vertical axis, we have this A, B, C, D, that basically represents the dominant benthos, so the type of organisms you can find the primary control on the ecologic um, production of these, um, of these organisms, the influence of the terrestrial environment, and modern settings. And on the horizontal axis, we have the degree of nutrient. Now, nutrient is often measured 
in milligram of chlorophyte alpha per cubic meter of water. We see that if we are below 0.1, we are in what is known as oligotrophic condition. So that means very little nutrient in the water. This is effectively a marine desert. And when you're in these conditions, you have the dominant benthos in the modern ocean tends to be corals because corals do very well with no nutrients but light penetration if they're in shallow water conditions. And nutrient limitation is really what controls this um, environment. If you put a lot of nutrients, the corals will tend to be replaced by other organisms. If you have low nutrients, corals will do well. Now, if you increase nutrient a, a little bit and you go into the mesotrophic zone, we start to have coral and algae together. And we have a lot of coralline algae. So that means an algae that precipitates calcium carbonates. That's a very common theme in ancient and modern coral reefs. So this is not an uncommon situation where in areas that are mesotrophic, in the low mesotrophic zone, you still have corals, they still do well, but they start to have competition with algae. And competition is really the key here. And if you go higher into the mesotrophic zone, so you increase the amount of nutrient again, you start to have macroalgae being formed, you lose the corals, and light become the main primary control on the uh, organisms that can be formed there. Above one milligram of chlorophyte alpha per cubic meter, you are in what is known as eutrophic condition. That means now we have enough nutrient. We're not hypertrophic, we don't have too much nutrient, but we have enough nutrient. And this is where you and I do well. This is where heterotrophs do well because they can feed on other organisms. So there you have um, algae that will grow and this algae will be eaten by different uh, plankton and this plankton then will be eaten by you know, bigger organisms, etc. So this is heterotrophic paradise if you want, but it is actually not really the best condition for autotrophs. And if you push that degree of nutrient supply even higher, you go into what is known as hypertrophic condition. And hypertrophic condition is pretty bad for anybody but bacteria, because in hypertrophic condition, you have so much nutrient that you basically promote the growth of bacteria very quickly, and they consume all of the oxygen of the water column. So you end up being in conditions that are low oxygen or these aerobic conditions, and so everything dies but the bacteria. And that's the sort of situation you'll have in sewers or when rivers with a lot of nutrients, either from agriculture or sewer, come into the ocean and you have all these, these uh, plankton bloom and then the bloom of bacteria and everything dies. So this is, this is not beneficial for anyone. So the way I like to portray this is to say that corals are the camels of the sea. Just like the camel has a hump and can survive with very little water in the desert, the corals can survive in the desert of the sea where we, where we have very little nutrients. And in fact, they thrive there. This is what they're, they're, um, they're used to. This is what they are adapted to do well in. So nutrient supply is a big control on carbonate production. So that brings me to my summary. So what have we learned in this class? Well, first, we've learned that the reef has an important function. It is a hydrological barrier. It controls the hydrodynamism of the system. Then we've learned that temperature ha has a very big control on modern carbonate distribution. Tropical water tend to be much better for shallow water tea factory organisms, which form most of the rock record, most of the sediments that we know. We've also seen that light penetration plays a big role. The more light you have, the better it is for autotrophs to grow. So again, the T factory will do better. The M and the C factory are much less controlled by light penetration. In fact, they don't really care about light. They can grow in dark waters. Then we've seen that nutrients favor heterotrophs. So it's not great for corals if you have lots of nutrient. That's why they would tend to be away from the continent, away from nutrient source coming from rivers, and of course also away from sediment supply. So in our next class, we'll start to look at carbonates as sediments, and I will introduce you 
to the classification of carbonate sediments and carbonate rocks.